Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'm really excited to kick off uh, this next section, and I'm grateful for uh, to the organizers for <laughs> giving me a slot. Um, so uh, I want <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about uh, uh, market design for education, mostly in the context of K through 12 in the United States, uh, in big school, uh, big city school districts, and. Uh, I think it's helpful to start uh, really from the beginning, the market design approach for education, I think started with research and policy efforts in, in Boston and New York City. So here on the left, I have a clipping from the Boston Globe uh, uh, talking about the paper that Typhoon and Attila wrote about uh, school choice uh, mechanism design approach and quoting Typhoon here, once all this is known, I don't see how they can keep the Boston mechanism. And here on the right is a, a clipping uh, from um, the New York Times about how game theory economic ideas helped improve uh, New York City's high school application process. Um, so uh, a lot of the work in market design and education has focused on assignment algorithms. So the Boston Globe article uh, continues to talk about the uh, Boston mechanism and its uh, issues with uh, um, giving advice to participants uh, and and alternatives uh, like the deferred acceptance algorithm, which is now the most popular system uh, used in um, many big city school districts. This has the advantage, according to this article, that uh, truthful lists are the best strategy. It's a strategy proof algorithm uh, and it eliminates justified envy. The other algorithm that many folks have uh, focused on is uh, top trading cycles. So uh, this is a variant of uh, that idea. Uh, and uh, here's a clipping from New Orleans, uh, the recovery school district used this mechanism. Uh, and so this is really exciting uh, for education market designers that these algorithms were used in the field. And if we think about the milestones that have taken place since uh, the Boston and New York City efforts, uh, there's a couple that I think are quite important. So one is uh, what happened in 2007 and 2009. Uh, so in 2007, uh, uh, through an act of parliament uh, in England, uh, the um, uh, country banned what they called first preference first arrangements for school assignment countrywide. Uh, and so this is quite uh, startling because as far as I could tell, this had no hand of an economist uh, involved. So I think this is important because it provides some external validation for some of the arguments that economists made uh, in the discussion in Boston because the Boston mechanism uh, is in fact an example of a first preference first uh, arrangement. And even more startling in 2009, after asking 15,000 applicants to apply to schools, uh, the city of Chicago ran a version of the Boston mechanism and said, man, we really messed up, let's do this again. Okay, so that's kind of pretty strong condemnation. And I think real life support, if only I could have orchestrated that experiment. <laughs> uh, they did this on their own volition. Um, the second major kind of milestone, I would say, uh, in uh, subsequent reform efforts was a bringing together of sectors uh, for assignment. So for the longest time and uh, continuing to this day, there is a, a fair amount of animosity between traditional public schools and charter schools. For those of you who don't know, a charter school is a publicly funded school that operates with a lot more autonomy uh, uh, than a traditionally, public, traditionally funded public school. Uh, in particular, most charter schools operate outside of collective bargaining agreements. Um, and, and at the um, beginning of the 2010s, there was a coming together uh, um, where the charter sector and the traditional public school sector said, well, why don't we simplify the admissions process for everyone, have a common application system, you apply on the uh, same form, you submit a rank order list, Denver and New Orleans, uh, um, where the pioneering districts in this effort um, that uh, folks call unified enrollment. Right here in Washington, DC, uh, we're almost on the 10th year of my schools, DC, where charter schools and traditional public schools are assigned on the same uh, exact system. Um, and so uh, that was quite exciting. And uh, there's been many other reforms in um, other US cities and around the world. Um, and if we were to take stock, the part of the goal of this conference is to take stock and look to the future, uh, I think some of the successes of the market design approach in uh, K through 12 are the following. First, I think uh, there has been progress in reducing strategizing and gaming uh, in getting into school. So now many districts give uh, families clear advice on how to navigate the system. Uh, we've seen a reduction in inefficient and un unfair assignments. 
uh, a lowering of, of application barriers, often due to technology. Um, there's increased collaboration across sectors, so uh, charters and traditional public schools, as well as other school sectors. Information is improved for applicants and administrators. Uh, you have all of this information collected centrally. Um, audits have been facilitated. So in fact, uh, the superintendent in Washington, DC was fired uh, thanks to the information collected by My Schools DC, where one of his staffers got into a school when they should not have. Uh, so I think that's good for transparency. Uh, so that happened about seven years ago. And uh, these systems have allowed for troubleshooting and further improvements. Um, so uh, that continues to be an ongoing research agenda of many people, including several in this room. So some of the active policy and research directions uh, include what I'll call policies focused on school demand. Uh, so within that class, there are uh, efforts to try to improve the type of information applicants have when they apply to school. Uh, so this is related to the uh, earlier sessions on um, decision aids and recommendation engines. Many people in the reform community call this Netflix for education, right? So Netflix gives you a recommendation, what movie to watch next. Why can't we use technology and machine learning to do the same for school? So um, Adam Kapoor here, uh, Chris Nielsen, who I think is also here, have uh, written about this and shown exactly how uh, folks might respond to this uh, kind of choice support. Other sets of reforms involve changing where students can apply. So an example of that is uh, Peng Shi's work in Boston, uh, defining a zone-free assignment plan, the, the home-based plan, uh, and studying the consequences of, of um, uh, such changes in kind of the choice basket. The second set of uh, active research uh, areas involve changing how the market clears. So uh, this involves tweaks to admissions criteria, like uh, the elimination of certain uh, priorities, like uh, the demise of walk zones in Boston, or many efforts that are ongoing right now across the United States on diversifying admissions to schools. So uh, here I'm thinking of um, uh, studies of the way Chicago has developed a race neutral form of affirmative action, something that uh, might become uh, top of the agenda for higher ed in the United States in a couple of weeks, or work that Oguzan, uh, who's here has done trying to contrast priority-based boosts with uh, quota and reserve systems. Uh, and then finally, algorithm changes. So uh, many people here in the room have studied the consequences of different ways of, of clearing the market. And uh, this is all uh, kind of very active and very exciting. And uh, as I pat myself on the back, uh, I'm kind of uh, um, maybe a bit cautious with patting myself on the back in light of uh, the public perception of some of these systems. Okay, so here is a clipping from the New York Times, uh, which uh, is entitled The Broken Promises of Choice in New York City Schools. Uh, the high school uh, admissions process was supposed to give every student a real chance to attend a good school, but 14 years in, it has not delivered, okay? And so that's the question I want to use my time to talk about today. Uh, and I want to set up a, a, a little bit of a, a debate between kind of two schools of thought in market design, uh, which is, uh, uh, especially in education, uh, approaches to think about market design reforms that have focused on uh, the question of who gets what. Okay, so that's you know inspired by um, Al's book. Uh, so I'll call that the bucket of market clearing policies. And I wanna contrast that with uh, um, uh, policies that focus on the what. Okay, what is it that we're allocating? Okay, and this is um, uh, maybe related a bit to what Derek said about entry barriers. Uh, uh, the computer science literature sometimes calls uh, uh, this resource augmentation, so evaluating the performance of an algorithm in terms of uh, what would happen if we have more resources. And the argument that I want to advance in this talk is that uh, even though I have spent and many of us have spent a lot of time focused on kind of market clearing policies, uh, I think to improve educational outcomes, there are far greater returns to focusing on policies that are uh, um, focused on resource augmentation. Okay, so what do I mean by resource augmentation in this context? So one example would be the creation of new schools. Um, so an example would be high expectations charter schools or efforts to have school takeovers like uh, what happened uh, in large part in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina or other innovative school models like the small schools reforms in New York City or the pilot schools in, in Boston. 
another type of policy that uh, I would classify as resource augmentation involves uh, policies about uh, uh, barriers to entry uh, of charter schools. So in many states in the United States, uh, we have a, a cap on the number of students who can attend a charter school. That's the case, uh, for instance, in Boston, no more than 35% of students can attend a charter school. Uh, and then finally, another thing that's high on the agenda uh, with post-pandemic enrollment loss in public schools is closing schools, okay? Um, so here's how I'm gonna uh, proceed, okay? So those of you who study auctions are probably familiar with this uh, article by Jeremy Bulow and Paul Klemperer that contrasts the effects of setting a reserve price optimally in an auction, let's call that market clearing, okay, with adding one more bidder to an auction. Okay, so let's see if we can do an empirical version of that in New York City, okay? And so my plan, and this is based on work with um, Attila Abdul Kadaroglu and Chris Walters, I'm gonna use data from New York City to compute achievement consequences of best case scenario market clearing policies. Okay, so suppose we succeeded with the recommendation engine. Suppose we got everyone to apply to schools where they're gonna learn the most. What would we get out of that, okay? And let's contrast that with uh, resource augmentation policies that achieve the equivalent student learning outcomes, okay? How many schools would I need to close and uh, um, uh, uh, to get to the same exact outcome as these best case market clearing policies, okay? okay? So this is the kind of horse race, the simulation I want to run. And uh, what I'm gonna argue is that improvements via resource allocation hold greater promise, and they actually appear more feasible, uh, both in principle and in practice based on history in New York City, okay? All right, so the setting here is uh, New York City. Okay, so this is kind of the case study from New York City. Uh, uh, we like this setting because it's the largest district in the US. Uh, we have credible estimates of school effectiveness. Uh, I'll be talking about math, uh, high school graduation, and college outcomes. And in New York, there has been a version of this debate in the last two decades, okay? So in the early 2000s, uh, there was this big change to the assignment system uh, with the adoption of deferred acceptance in the Bloomberg era. Uh, now, Bloomberg uh, uh, had a pretty aggressive school closure policy. This, this is why he almost he didn't get another term. Uh, they created many new schools. Okay, so Bloomberg was a, a, a politician who was focused on the what, you could say, in this um, um, time period. Uh, the mayor that came after, Bill de Blasio, uh, decided to devote a lot of attention to de-screening. Okay, so changing the admissions priorities used at particular high schools. And his signature effort is what's called diversity in admissions. Okay, so Let's take schools, let's try to uh, um, engineer certain demographic profiles attending certain schools, okay? So you could say de Blasio is focused on, on who gets what, okay? Um, okay, so just to uh, set the stage just a little bit more, I'm going to be talking about um, measures of school effectiveness and uh, I'm gonna be decomposing uh, potential outcomes for a student, let's say student I at school J in terms of three components. Uh, so the first is what we'll call their general ability. Okay, so we'll model that using uh, their covariates. The second is a vertical dimension. Okay, so that's only indexed by J here. So I'll call that the average treatment effect of the school. And then finally, MIJ is a, you could say a horizontal dimension. That's the match effect. That's what matching theorists should care about, match effects, right? Uh, so what we do in this paper is uh, we want to measure YIJ for each student and school combination. And I won't tell you the, the full details on this, but um, today what I'm gonna show you is based on a selection on observables assumption um, where we have lag, lag score controls, okay? Um, and uh, we're using empirical Bayes shrinkage. Uh, we feel pretty confident about this strategy. We validated this in other papers. Now estimating uh, the dimensionality of match effects is gonna be central for our exercise here. So uh, the way we proceed here is uh, we use principal components analysis to arrive at three dimensions, essentially um, baseline match, math, uh, minority status, and female. So what we're saying is attending a school, if I am a minority or if I'm a female or I have uh, low baseline math scores could be different for me than for someone who has different characteristics. Okay, that's the match effect here. Okay, so now let's look at the promise. Okay, so let's imagine that we could have students rank and attend schools based on effectiveness. What would be the outcome? Okay, so that's demand side policies, okay? That's the recommendation uh, engine agenda. The second question I wanna start with is, 
what if on the school side, instead of fighting about how many kids should get into Stuyvesant a High School in New York City, what would happen if schools admitted students based on who would learn the most at the school? Okay, let's start off there. Now, um, uh, the reason why you might be excited about recommendation engines in this context is uh, the following figure. So what I have here is kids in New York City. Uh, on the y-axis, I have a gains in math, okay? Everything I'm doing here is a standard deviation unit, okay? So just to benchmark this, in New York City, the black-white achievement gap is about 0.8 standard deviations, okay? So relative to the actual ranking of a kid, their first choice, that's in blue here, uh, their first choice, if they got to attend that school, their uh, math uh, effects would be predicted to increase by 0.1 standard deviation, okay? Now, what if I whispered in their ear and I used my Netflix recommendation engine and said, why don't you apply to the school where you're gonna learn the most, okay? Well, the average achievement gain for that kid, if, if they got into that first choice school is 0.7 standard deviation, okay? That's gigantic, right? That's what's uh, potentially quite exciting about this. And you see that gap is pretty similar, second choice, third choice, uh, so on and so forth, okay? Now, I'm not clearing the market here, okay? I'm just saying, what would happen if you could apply to the school that gives you the highest value add and you got in? What about this, the school side, okay? So what would happen if schools admitted students by learning gains? So here I'm going to every single school, I'm saying, according to my estimate of effectiveness, which students would learn the most at this school, okay? And then I'm taking the average across schools, okay? Uh, so when I do that, uh, because I'm taking this average across schools, okay, and where I'm headed is, school quality is mostly vertical, okay, uh, not horizontal. Uh, the effects are not as large, okay, 0 0.095 for, for math uh, and about 0 0.04 for high school graduation and college. Okay, now let's take this one step further and let's clear the market, okay? So uh, I'm gonna look at four different uh, counterfactual allocations, okay? So the first is what I'll call aligned uh, demand. This is where students rank schools in order of effectiveness, and I leave the supply side unchanged, okay? The second is aligned supply. So schools rank students in order of effectiveness, and the student side's unchanged, okay? The third is, let's do both of those, okay? Still working in the ordinal domain. And then the fourth is, let's say I'm the central planner, and I compute the allocation that maximizes overall treatment effects uh, of kids in New York City, okay? This is a benchmark. Uh, and uh, what happens, okay? So uh, uh, the title of this slide is The Equilibrium Strikes Back, okay? Uh, what happens is there's just not enough capacity at the schools that are very effective. So aligned demand results in an a, a overall math effect of 0 0.037 standard deviations, okay? If I'm able to implement this treatment effect maximizing, what we call TEMA allocation, it's 0 0.082 standard deviations. Uh, that's a very big if, as uh, many of you know, it's challenging to uh, um, <clears throat> implement such an outcome. And the underlying fact driving this is that variation in school quality is more vertical than horizontal. So if we think about reallocated policies or market clearing policies more generally, there's limited scope for aggregate uh, improvements, okay? Now, uh, this is really an idealized first uh, uh, benchmark, right, because Students are not sorted based on match effects in the status quo. So leveraging match effects requires massive changes in assignment. So this treatment effects maximization outcome would eliminate choice entirely. Implementing market clearing policies to achieve these uh, effects seems quite difficult, I'd say, based on the evidence that we have so far. So uh, we would require large scale behavioral changes to get aligned demand if everyone ranks schools based on demand. Uh, because uh, applicants don't appear to rank schools by effectiveness. And if we think about the debate on who should get into the school that's happening across the country, uh, those uh, changes to admissions policies rarely seem to be based on effectiveness in, in practice, okay? Now, you can also look at what happens to the racial makeup of schools, how much kids have to travel, uh, uh, and uh, what choices we would be assigning people to under these uh, counterfactuals. And the changes are dramatic, okay? So I just wanna say this really is this idealized first best, and still we're not getting very far in, in the aggregate. So now let's compare this to resource augmentation, okay? So here's how I'm gonna model this, okay? Let's close the lowest performing schools in New York City based on their average treatment effect, okay? Once I close the school, I gotta do something with the kids who used to be going to those schools, right? So I'm gonna consider two versions, okay? One I'll call effective replacement, 
So what does this do? This says, if I close uh, um, X schools, I will reallocate the seats proportionally to the top X schools uh, according to average treatment effects. Okay, you could say this is smart closures, okay? Uh, typical replacement is I'm simply going to reallocate seats to all schools proportionally. Okay, this is naive uh, 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 reallocation of the seats at the closed schools. So um, what do I do after I close these schools? I basically rerun uh, the deferred acceptance algorithm using these new capacities, okay? And what I'm going to try to do is find this kind of equivalent variation exercise, okay? The, let's find the number of school closures needed to arrive at the same change in educational outcomes as aligned demand on the one hand, or the treatment effect maximizing allocation on the other. And those other two cases I consider are in between, okay? So this is kind of the, the, uh, the two poles that are sufficient. And um, here's the bottom line here, okay? So the equivalent closures, just focus on column one. To get to that same match effect uh, as, uh, math effect, sorry, as aligned demand, uh, in New York City, I would need to close 15 high schools, okay? If I did a smart replacement, effective replacement, that's 5% of schools in New York City. If I do a typical replacement, a naive replacement, we've also looked at a neighborhood-based replacement policy where I just create seats at schools in the neighborhood that are nearby. It's very similar to typical. Uh, I had to have to close about 10% of schools, okay, uh, 29 schools. It's pretty similar across uh, these other outcomes. Uh, high school graduation, the number of schools I need to close is even smaller. Uh, for college, it's, it's quite comparable. Now, that's aligned demand. Remember, aligned demand is this hypothetical, right, where people are ranking schools by effectiveness. I've never seen anything close to uh, something like that being implemented in the field. TEMA, treatment effect maximization, requires uh, uh, more closures, okay, but that really is an idealized uh, first best, okay? Um, now, uh, compared to the equivalent market clearing policies, if I look at how much disruption is caused by these closures system-wide, uh, closures have more modest effects on the overall racial and income segregation of uh, the city as uh, uh, students. Um, they have uh, relatively modest effects on distance and travel. You might be saying, well, we close schools because we're really concerned about equity for certain subgroups of students, okay? And this entire argument would work too if I said, let's just target improving outcomes for low baseline math kids or for minority kids. I would still do better by closing. In fact, I do even better by closing schools because those kids are disproportionately at the schools that we would recommend closing, okay? So it's better just to close those schools. Uh, now, I said that this is more feasible, and I'm going to make that argument based on history, okay, in New York City. So it's more feasible in terms of the disruption in my simulation, point number one. Point number two, uh, it turns out uh, from 2007 to 2017, uh, New York City closed 15% of high schools, okay? So uh, the numbers I showed you in the last table, you know, within the, the right ballpark. Now, what were the schools that they closed? Okay, uh, so there were schools that have low average treatment effects. Um, and uh, according to our, our closure policy, the schools that we'd close tend to have lower achievement levels. They would have large shares of black and Hispanic students and be located in lower income neighborhoods. And that overlaps uh, pretty considerably with the schools that Bloomberg actually closed, okay? So I'm uh, making this point to say that this might be feasible, okay? In fact, uh, if I just plot the high school graduation levels of high schools in New York City on the y-axis, and I sort schools, okay, uh, uh, in order of lowest graduation level on the left and highest on the right, if you can see this, uh, any point that is red here is a school that was closed, okay? So what did New York City effectively do? They just closed schools that have low graduation levels. Okay, so when things are really egregiously bad, the graduation level is 25%, the school got closed, you know, uh, 10 years after our time period. Uh, now, there's some uh, exceptions there uh, where schools had um, graduation levels about 65% or so. Uh, those tend to uh, have to do with facilities issues, actually. Uh, now, uh, how did New York City uh, close these schools and why graduation levels? A school that, that has a high graduation level need not be ineffective. You know, it, it says nothing about their value added uh, where the kids came in, right? But here's kind of uh, uh, something that surprised me. So uh, what if I do that same exact sort based on average treatment effects, okay? So here on the y-axis, I have the uh, average treatment effect of the high schools on the uh, x-axis, I've sorted the schools by the schools that are least effective on high school graduation to the most effective. And what you see here is that 
Closing schools based on levels does pretty well. Uh, it's comparable to closing schools based on effectiveness on the left tail of the distribution, okay? So what I'm saying in simple English is when a school is really poor performing, it's probably got a low value added, okay? That's another argument I'd like to advance that this is possibly feasible because it's easy to make the case that these schools should be closed, okay? 20% of kids are graduating. So the question now is who decides? If, we, if I'm advocating for large-scale cl school closures, uh, do we trust the central planner to do this, or are there market signals inside the assignment process that reveal this information? And what we've just learned is that actual school closures appear to be strongly related to high school graduation levels. Um, and so high schools with low graduation rates tend to have low graduation average treatment effects. So a central planner, a regulator, using a really crude rule of thumb like New York City appears to have done, would have identified many of the schools that we would optimally close given all of our calculations, okay? Uh, now, what about the demand side signals? Okay, let's look at where people applied. Okay, that's what I'm gonna call the market signal. Uh, those are not as uh, sharp as um, uh, this simple closure policy that New York City had. And we've already seen that demand is only loosely related to effectiveness. That was my very first figure, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, many of the schools that were closed uh, were still in demand, okay? And in, in fact, that's why Bloomberg got all this grief for trying to close schools down, right? Because parents wanted those schools. And that's what I would like to conclude with, okay? So uh, we need to understand why, okay? So most of the education market design community, myself included, have concentrated on market clearing policies, but I hope to have convinced you, at least in New York City, that their overall effects on learning are small, even in best case scenarios, okay? Uh, on the other hand, closing ineffective schools and expanding effective ones appears to be a, a better policy for learning gains. So in terms of new directions, I think uh, the market design community should think about how should we soften the impact of closing schools? How do we make that more palatable? Or someone once told me, how do we, uh, what keeps these zombie schools thriving, right? Is this uh, about the collective bargaining agreement? Is this about hard hit communities getting hit yet again because their school has been closed down in, in the South Bronx? Uh, and so that raises questions that I think we need to understand. What is it that's driving demand for low performing or low value added schools, okay? Uh, and this may be where information campaigns or choice architecture or decision aids could play a role here. If we are able to communicate to the communities that we're taking their schools away because we're trying to help them, maybe that will soften the blow. Now, another idea on this that uh, is quite interesting to me is uh, what New Orleans did. Okay, so New Orleans is a poster child for active management of school. They closed schools down, uh, um, uh, especially in the late 2000s. Uh, as part of their assignment algorithm, if I'm in a school that's closed, I would get closing school priority. Okay, so that's even better than sibling priority when I apply to school. I basically get a lottery ticket to go to any school I want. Okay, so they've explicitly given compensation to the kids who had their schools closed. Okay, so I think that's an interesting idea, something that uh, we should try to study more. Um, and uh, let me just wrap up with this kind of stylized fact that many people in K through 12 education are grappling with. You know, after COVID, there has been a massive decline in public school enrollment. Okay. So imagine you took the entire New York City public school district with 1.1 million kids and erased them from the ledger, right? 2% of kids uh, uh, no longer go to public schools, okay? So districts are gonna have to close schools. So this is a great opportunity for us in market design to have uh, some role in that conversation. At least it should be based on some uh, um, uh, measures of effectiveness. Uh, and I think that's a, a, an exciting direction for us. So let me stop here, hand it over to Derek.